And that's when we realized that actually we couldn't, uh, up to that point, we've been able to cope with it. But it was actually not a technology challenge, but it, uh, we needed to uh, raise significant amounts of money to be able to support that rate of growth because the business was cash flow negative in times when you were going through street. We could support growth at 10 or 15% a year reasonably comfortably, but when it was going up to sort of two or 300% a year, that, that was proving challenging. <laughs> so a nice problem to have, but uh, it was certainly a, a problem we would have rather done without at the time. Rupert makes an excellent point. What he says in that little clip, he says, they could have coped with 10 to 15% growth, but going from that to two to 300% growth is something they hadn't legislated for. And in fact, all of us that go into business, we don't know whether our business is going to grow at an alarming rate or a steady rate or a rate that we think we can cope with. And I guess the lesson is expect the unexpected, particularly if you have a really good product. And we're all trying to get our products bought. We want to grow our businesses. We want to be successful in our lives, but we can't always legislate for the potential unknown things that are going to happen. And I guess part of being in business on your own, even with a small team, is actually the most exciting bit, right? You just don't know what's going to happen next. This is a really fantastic, interesting story. Plus, also Rupert gives some fantastic tips in terms of business growth, because after all, that's what he does. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Rupert. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks very much. Brilliant. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We only recently spoke to one another and I managed to convince you to come on the podcast. So I really appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. Uh, thank you. I'm very, very flattered to have been asked. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so um, I, I ask um, the first question to get the ball rolling, really, to hear your story. Um, we go right back to the beginning. So tell us a little bit about your personal life uh, to start with. So where were you born? Uh, maybe a little bit about your education, uh, where you now live. Have you moved around? Um, so people get a sense of Rupert and how we all got started. Okay, now thanks, Michael, for asking the question. Uh, well, I was born originally in Norfolk. Uh, not that I can remember it, of course. Uh, my family uh, traditionally, when I was much younger, were, uh, loved farming, uh, but they also moved around a little bit. So we moved down to um, Devon and then back into Sussex and then ultimately into Kent as well. Um, I, I, my mum and dad found it really difficult with farming to make a, a decent um, a crust out of it. Wow. And uh, yeah, so and because my parents moved around quite a bit as well, I was actually sent to um, sort of private school or boarding schools um, and stayed till I was about 14 or so. Um, wouldn't at times very happy, other times not so happy mm. um, because it's not a lot of fun living away from home, especially when you're eight or nine years old. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously, that uh, becomes part of the great uh, formation of your character at that particular point. Yes. Um, went into the, the, the state school system at about the age of 15 or 16. If I'm very honest, didn't particularly like it. Uh, left at uh, 16, went straight into work. And uh, that's when things really started to change because I suddenly enjoyed being part of everything and realised that uh, you can do work, but also have a lot of fun at the same time. Mm. And and w what was it specifically about school you didn't enjoy? Um, well, I, I, at the time, I was extremely short, and um, I'm still quite short now, actually, but I think probably uh, about five foot six, five foot seven, so just about respectable uh, height-wise. But I was always seen as a little bit of a, a butt of the joke at the time, and when you're at... Um, uh, you know, boarding school as well uh, is an environment you just can't get away from. Mm. Um, so I did, did have a you know, number of good friends at school, but you were just around that all the time. And actually, you wanted to be of your own space as well, So, which obviously you don't have in that type of environment. No, absolutely. 
I mean, I I have never been to boarding school. I had a friend uh, when we lived in the Netherlands. He went to boarding school in England, actually. And, uh, yeah, I felt really sorry for him because it felt like, and I know this is not the case, but it felt like, you know, his parents were sending him away, basically. And I could never get my head around it. Um, I mean, I know it's part of British society, that type of education, but yeah, it must be tough on, on, on youngsters, definitely. Uh, yes, because obviously it's nice to, I'm very lucky because I had a brother and two sisters. Um, so, you know, there's benefits with it as well. Uh, my parents at the time felt they were doing the right thing. They're typically from a, you know, a forces type background. Yes. Um, so I, and in those days, people did perhaps send children away more to go to school. It's not something that we ever wanted to do. Um, and certainly when, I, when our son was born, who's now 22, mm -hmm. and we made a conscious decision that was never going to happen to him. And fortunately, it's turned out to be very well, very well grounded and gone to university in a, in a very good career now. So I'm very proud of him. Brilliant. Brilliant. OK, so um, what was the first job then at such a young age? <laughs> uh, well, when I first uh, started working, unfortunately, it's going to give away my uh, age. Uh, it was 1973. And um, certainly if you're listening to this in the UK as a podcast, um, then you'll be probably familiar with the uh, power strike, power strike uh, you know, uh, sorry, power engineers uh, strikes and also the coal miner strikes. And you had a period of uh, times of massive blackouts, which lasted for uh, six to eight hours at a time, typically. Um, and uh, but uh, uh, very unusually, although you've got a period of very high inflation, inflation was running at about 22 to 25 percent at its peak, I believe, from Whoa. memory, which is ridiculously high. Uh, when we're very low inflation times at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but on the other side of it, um, you had um, ultra low unemployment. So mm. it was a period of, I think it was only about half a million unemployed in the UK at the time. And of course, that measurement of being predominantly people who are transit between roles anyway. So to all intents and purposes, you got zero unemployment. Um, so I was very lucky that when I started to go out to looking for work, um, I was offered pretty well everything that I applied for. Um, so it only started um, off uh, basically in a bank for three or four years, um, and then sort of progressed from there. Uh, but there were certainly interesting times, and um, it's very strange also looking back then, um, you know, how we are now relying on automation and uh, computers and, in, you know, the internet and all this stuff, the social media and everything else that goes with it. Mm -hmm. um, how then I remember in a bank having to use calculators which had a handle on them, um, which you had, every time you tap a set of numbers and you'd actually pull a handle, <laughs> which was a sense dis distinctly archaic, and it was. <laughs> um, so, but it actually was a blessing when you had the power cuts because you were still able to operate the, uh, uh, the calculators. So mm -hmm. um, then all the electronic ones came in and uh, replaced it, of course. But uh, anyway, so that's well, history. I I'm going to show my age now as well, <laughs> Rupert, because <laughs> when I started working in the UK, which was in 1977, um, we did not have co computers either. We used ledgers. Um, I was in kind of planning and production on textiles, and uh, we had to write with pencil with a rubber on the end of the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where we had to write figures in and then rub it out. And the worst thing I remember to this day was when you rub a, a, an amount out on the ledger and then you have to replace it with the new number, is trying to remember what the original number was and, oh, it was horrible. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, people have got it very good these days with all the technology. <laughs> and to be fair, I'm enjoying it as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I'm afraid of techno geek. So anytime there's a new Apple Mac that comes out or a new iPhone, I'm afraid I'm straight out there, probably at the front of the queue. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so definitely a long way off from using manual calculators, anyway. So. Okay. So so into banking for a while. Uh, what happened next? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was in banking for uh, four years in total. Um, I met some lovely people that had lots of fun, as you do when you're in your late teens, early 20s, mm. um, but actually got a bit bored with it as well at the end. And 
decided to have a, a different uh, change of career. Um, went into buying for a big supermarket chain at their head office, um, which, uh, interesting enough, was in the fruit and veg space, which uh, uh, the reason I said it was quite interesting because it was Safeways at the time, which, of course, no longer exists. Um, they would all order you know, literally lorry loads of cauliflowers and apples and oranges and all this type mm. of stuff. But the, the thing which I found fascinating about that is that uh, in many pr- prices were extremely volatile, especially with vegetables. Yeah. So if you get to the winter and you get a very severe frost, you'd suddenly find, find that certain types of vegetables, the price would dramatically increase. Yes. Then what would happen is you then got weather changes, then you suddenly get prices drop. Uh, very sharply. So in some ways, it was almost a bit like uh, buying on the stock exchange because prices were so volatile. You had to be careful to buy, you know, um, the, the fruit and veg, as it were, uh, yes. at, at the right time yes. because this was all being bought to go into massive uh, supermarkets. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, that was actually a lot of fun, but then had a further career change, went much more into a sales-based environment, uh, which was in for about eight years and actually I thoroughly enjoyed that for quite a while. Wow. So eight years in the kind of, what kind of sales was it? Kind um, of phase? Well, it's distinctly unfashionable, just as banks have become unfashionable uh, now. Uh, but then uh, it was an estate agency, uh, very much like uh, property, and it was had an interest yes. in property. Yeah. And um, and th- that was a lot of good fun. Uh, turned what was the uh, worst performing office in the group to the second best performing in two years. It's, it's only a 15-branch firm at the time, but... Um, Considering where the, the level that started from and where it ended up, was very pleased, and I put a lot of that down to having being part of a really good organisation, but also having the edge to recruit well, bringing some really good people, and realise that um, actually it's not you don't necessarily recruit on qualification; you recruit more on aptitude and attitude. Um, and uh, so, uh, and we ended up by making some really good hires at the time which helped that um, branch to go from strength to strength. Oh, wow. And so that's so was that more kind of face-to-face then as well with people? Uh, yes, and I, I really enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, interacting both with the sellers of houses, but also I think we called applicants at the time. I think it might be called buyers now. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to actually put parties together uh, help on the negotiation side so that you can get the right deal uh, for your clients, which of course is the seller. Um, and also, you know, encouraging people, you know, potential purchasers to do the right thing for themselves. So quite often people need a bit of guidance when choosing a home, you know, school scores can be very important location, a whole range of other factors. Um, so it was certainly a very interesting uh, period of time. Um, but decided ultimately to move on on from that because I wanted a fresh challenge. Yes. Uh, yeah. And at that point, went into, a, um, in fact, a very big catalyst for change there, going back to the subject of computers, um, was uh, at the time, um, people in the agency space would predominantly use index cards to keep yes. lists of potential purchases and um, uh, at the time, Amstrad had just launched a new range of computers yeah, and uh, I was a little bit of a techno geek then as well, and I created our own um, uh, database, and that was installed into the branch which I was a, a partner of, and that led to a whole series of catalysts of change because we realised how that transformed that one branch. And this is bear in mind at the time, very very few branches of any form of computerization. Mm. And uh, especially as we were pushing out a whole lot of material to potential purchases. Yeah. And um, so I ultimately ended up by setting up my own system software house from that. And we installed, I think it's about 130 systems into uh, different branches of estates throughout the UK at the time, um, wow. casting great big PCs around with you know, old cathode ray tube monitors <laughs> wow. and installing networks. And that was a lot of good fun. So I did that for about five or six years and then moved on to a few other things after that. And that was, what well, was that the first serious kind of experience into IT computing then? Um, yes, I suppose it was. And uh, interesting at the time, there were reasonable margins in boxes. So yes. if you... If you bought a computer in those days, it might cost you 
say a couple of thousand pounds, mm. um, whereas a, you can't, yeah, and that was almost running, running out of steam, as it were. Um, but what would happen is there'd be typically about a 35% margin in each box. Yes. Um, so effectively, it helps us to cross subsidize the software that we've developed. And, um, you know, if someone was installing a 10 branch, uh, it's 10, um, sorry, 10 computer systems, 10 uh, PC system in the same office, then it might have been like a £15,000 spend, which mm. obviously, bear in mind, this is update prices in those days. Um, so there'd be good margins in it. But obviously, that all changed. And um, so these days, everything is very low margin when you talk about uh, uh, technology in particular, especially if it's a commoditized product now, which computers, of course, are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I, I realize there's much more opportunity in the whole area of software development and um, database design and consultancy and all that type of good stuff the words around it wow okay that sounds fascinating i mean <laughs> it's it's quite a big change although i guess were you having to convince people to buy these as well so did you have to do kind of sales presentations or did the product sell itself um, I'd love to say it sold itself, and to a large extent, um, it did. Uh, yeah. But quite often, people don't necessarily know the problem that it can solve. So you have to explain to someone the benefits of introducing, in that case, uh, technology to be able to help them to manage their list of prospects and to be able to efficiently send out details through the post, which the post was heavily relied on at the time. Um, to potential uh, applicants or purchases. Yes. Um, so, but when, when people actually got it and realized how much money and time it would save them, uh, it did become a total no, no brainer um, as a proposition. Yeah. Um, so, but it's, it's then I started to get much more interested in technology and went much more into systems and database design and realized, and um, that was a big lesson, that by doing the things in the right way, you could also help to really leverage. Um, use technology to leverage uh, business growth through a whole right. range of different areas. Um, so that went much more into um, software design and consultancy for um, an insurance company, Stroke Bank. Um, also went out to Singapore, not not through the same line of work, but through on the software side particularly, mm. um, to uh, Singapore three times and the Philippines a couple of times. Uh, did some work with some major banks out there as well, but helping them with some of their IT systems and some of their rollouts. Uh, which is quite good fun. Brilliant. And and so how long, because I know you're not doing this today, how long did that last for? How long were you doing this? Um, I suppose in total, it, that was about another f four or five years. Right. And uh, it, interesting, it was during the, and at the time I was getting paid really silly amounts of money for what I was doing, which is, is all very nice. And I was also having a, a great fun as well. Um, but actually, there was a, another big catalyst for change that came along because uh, uh, some friends of ours actually had two dogs that were stolen. And um, oh. so, uh, and obviously, this is quite a while ago now. Um, but what happened was I was in a very well-paid job, and it effectively, it was more of a contracting role in the end, so I had quite a bit of free time as well. And um, I, that person basically came to me and said, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if a service could be set up as a national service? So that when Fido goes missing or is stolen, that uh, somehow, you know, we could help them get them, their pets back again. Yes. And we, myself, my wife, and uh, were, have always been animal lovers. Um, so I thought, well, okay, we, what, let, you know, the use of the internet at the time was obviously starting to come in in a big way. Um, I was a bit of a geek anyway. So for me, it was relatively easy to set something up online as a centralized uh, database. Um, so that's precisely what happened. And initially, it's what started off as very much, a, uh, you know, a, a charitable endeavour to um, help people to get their pets back home. And bear in mind that um, around about three hundred thousand dogs and cats go missing every year. Wow. And uh, about, I think I can't remember the numbers now, but there's about seventy or eighty thousand a year which are believed to be stolen as well. Um, so it's quite a big number. Yeah. Um, and our affection for animals uh, goes off the Richter scale almost as much as with our own children, as it were. Yes. So uh, we set up a service at the time and it started to capture people's imagination. We started to get a little bit of press coverage over it. And um, I thought, well, OK, we got a bit of fun with this. Why don't we take it on to the next level? 
and set up a service which is designed not only to help when things go wrong, but is also designed to help you get FIDO back again or, or prevent that happening in the first case. So we've struck an arrangement with a lot of vets and rescue centres and, and so on so that, uh, and tied in with the an unique ID tag, which also integrated with microchipping. Um, and set up a 24-hour call handling facility um, and then start a speech to a number of insurance companies and um, uh, more than and Sainsbury's Pet Insurance, Direct Line and so on were came on board as um, partners. And um, over at its peak, we were probably handling about twenty to 30,000 calls a month. Wow. An average call time of 14 minutes. So we had to grow from literally husband, wife, dog, cat, son, living from home into offices employing about 65 people. Um, so, uh, and that, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, very, it became quite stressful in the end because actually what we had done is created something which was really a really very small cottage business, which really wasn't a business at all to start with, into something which had a, a much bigger impact and also managed to get the attention of the national press and TV as well at the time. So it really caught people's imagination. Um, but actually, that also became it's also its biggest Achilles heel. So, although I'm pleased to say the service does still exist to this day under another name, um, after growing astronomically, um, unfortunately, uh, one of our biggest mistakes, or one of the biggest mistakes, we took on a massive client um, and we'd been speaking to for four years. And uh, basically, to cut a long story short, We'd, uh, based on the numbers being given to us, we expected the call volume to go up about 10 or 15%. And that was, bear in mind, we're handling 20, 20 to 30,000 calls a month. Mm. Um, it actually almost doubled, not because that client was twice as big as all the rest, as it were, but it was actually because the profile of that uh, customer was much more akin, most clearly, closely aligned to the offer that we had made available. Um, so we needed to be able to comp continue to support continued almost exponential growth. Yes. And we would have needed massive amounts of money to actually have funded that growth. Mm. Um, so that became a real challenge and uh, we nearly lost our house over that and everything. And uh, it was a bit of a horrible time, actually, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but one of the things I felt very strongly about is that customers should still actually have a, a service Yes, um, and that's why even today, even though I'm not involved with it, um, it does st still exist, and um, it's a bit of a shadow of its former self. But it, it's still set out to achieve its still serving its original objectives, which which is good. And, um, and the just so I can be clear, and, and although this is not the meat of what we're going to get into eventually, but. The twenty to thirty thousand, which became forty to sixty thousand calls a month. What were these calls for? Uh, well, it's, it's really two, several different things actually. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is with pet dogs and cats physically going missing, right. you know, because we became effectively a central register. Yes. Um, which vets and rescue centres and police stations and dog wardens and is ring into. Uh, the vets, vet nurses and the vets loved us as well, so they'd be ringing us up all the time when right. they speak with us. Um, also, people ringing up to claim their free membership, which right. we gave them at the time. Um, and because the, uh, you know, there's something like 1.4 million dogs and cats born every year, believe it or not. It's almost the same as human birth rate. Right. It's just the average cat and dog only lives 11 years, where as us humans live for 80 years or so, give or yeah. take. Um so it's a massive market. Uh, so the fact that it was tied into something, you know, uh, we all care, you know, care about for animal lovers, mm. um, then it just struck a chord. And it was the fact that with this particular uh, insurer, um, the profile of customers were especially well aligned to our offer. It, right. We thought it was good with everyone else. But it, it literally meant we just moved into our third new office in two years, which we had funded out of our own pockets. And we literally just moved in a few weeks before. Then this major partner came on board, most completely unexpectedly after very long discussions. And uh, we realized, we thought we'd have to increase our staffing by 10%, but actually we would need to have pushed up to about 110, 120 people to yeah. have supported that rate of growth. 
And that's wow. when we realized that actually we couldn't, uh, up to that point, we've been able to cope with it. But it was actually not a technology challenge, but it, uh, we needed to uh, raise significant amounts of money to be able to support that rate of growth because the it. business was cash flow negative in times when you were going through street. We could support growth at 10 or 15% a year reasonably comfortably, but when it was going up to sort of two or 300% a year, that, that was proving challenging. <laughs> so a nice problem to have, but uh, it was certainly a, a problem we would have rather have done without at the time. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is such a wonderful example for all the businesses and wannabe businesses to listen to, because we all have this dream of starting our own business and becoming mega successful. Um, but actually, sometimes that explosive growth, and as you said, it was unexpected, can actually also not be such good news. <laughs> um, so sometimes we just want that gradual growth, don't we, ideally? Because being able to cope, and with, to cope with such explosive growth overnight can also be a massive problem to deal with. Yes, and, and in, in, you know we had um, sort of planned for growth, mm. um, but with this particular partner we'd been speaking to for four years, um, and they, uh, I won't give the name of the concern, no. concern just in case it might be sensitive, but what was really interesting, that what suddenly led to that deal coming about was that one key person left from one insurance company and that, that person wasn't even that senior, but he actually was a major influencer. Mm. And he literally joined a competitor insurance company, which the, was the firm we'd been to for four years. And literally overnight, well, let's say overnight, it was within two weeks that major um, partner was speaking to us and started, to re right, we want to have this in yesterday. Yeah. Um, and we were able to support almost all of it, but it, and we could have supported the amount of growth that was predicted based mm. on the numbers they gave us mm. but uh, it, it was a uh, it was the fact the offer was so well aligned um that the uh, that that created a massive demand far greater than we'd expected yeah. um so but anyway so it's, it's all one of life's rich elements of learning as it were but um yes and i wouldn't want to say that to discourage people from going from strong growth but what i would say is if you've got a very compelling uh, proposition uh, just make sure that you are well supported in that growth and also yeah. well funded to be able to support it too, because you can have a business which on paper is making money. But if, on the other hand, your service requires quite a bit of cash up front to service that need, you can have a profitable business, but you can have a business which is cash flow negative yes. until the revenues had a chance to catch up. And uh, actually, at the end of the day, it's the money that you've got available to draw on. Um, that you know, cash is king. Uh, profits are really important, but also cash is extreme, even more important. Having that liquidity to be able to support the growth is very yeah. important. Yeah. A friend of mine did a workshop the other day on public speaking, but he showed this little diagram and he explained that revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is king. Uh, that's lovely. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> it's so true. Yes. So true. Yeah, definitely. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so so you got out or you sold the business, I take it. Uh, yes, uh, it, uh, it'd be polite to say I uh, got out. It was, in effect, it became one of crisis management in the end because uh, we realised we dug ourselves a massive hole. Mm. Um, so, I, but to a certain extent, I was able to engineer the continuance of the service that's the one part that i was able to help a little bit even though i had to contribute a huge amount of my own time myself you know at no cost which i was very pleased to do because you know i felt passionately about the cause behind it yes um but uh there's certain parts that right when do go completely out of your control and um uh you know as i say we literally within about a week of losing our house it was really really severe and it took us probably three or four years really to recover from that, um, that whole experience. So um, I needless to say, my wife was very brave. There was a rolling pin on one side of my head and a frying pan on the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was almost like one of those Tom and Jerry cartoon sketches yes. where you expect to be completely flat by the end of it. But yes. uh, 
I, I'm still alive to this day, so I guess I must have been forgiven at some stage. Yes. Oh, well done. Well done. Okay, what and then after those three and four years, what, what did you decide to do after that? Um, well, I suppose, to be frank, for a couple of years, um, I suppose I got slightly lost um, as part of the journey because um, the only way I can describe it um, is in many ways it's almost a bit like a bereavement. Uh, so because when things do go horribly long, wrong like that, uh, first of all, you're really sort of questioning yourself as to why that's uh, uh, why that's happened. And you also feel a real sense of shame and blame over it as well. So uh, I was really having to, at a personal level, grapple with that. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I, I managed to get some sort of different pieces of work, which I did enjoy doing and it helped to just put a bit of food on the table. Uh, but I was in what I described probably for two or three years, a, a real period of uh, transition. Yes. Um, and um, And really, this is ultimately how Business Growth Bureau came about actually as an organization because what I realized when I sat down and looked at it, I felt I felt, I felt had a lot to share um, with other people in terms of good. I did a lot of personal, well, I say personal coaching. It wasn't, it was personal coaching in the sense it was one to one. Mm. But what I really noticed is that I started off my services out just supporting coaching individual entrepreneurs and probably helped about 50 or 60 of them over about a 12 month period. Yes. in a business startup scenario. And I realized how much I was enjoying it. And also the feedback I was getting was really uh, positive. Yes. And I said, well, actually, I do have quite a bit of knowledge. Why don't I start to uh, share this with other people, but do it on a much bigger scale? Mm. And it, was, um, uh, it, was, it wasn't it was even my idea. Um, it was a charity I'd started to uh, work with at the time, who does a lot of work with organizations in the not-for-profit space. And the CEO of the charity approached me and said, look, Rupert, you've got a lot of experience over marketing and sales and also using LinkedIn and all these other type of things. And um, I gave him a lot of informal help. He just asked for a bit of guidance for him and his management team. Mm -hmm. And that led to another catalyst chain of events. And he said, look, what you've done has been so helpful to us. Why, why don't I offer a service to help other business owners to really scale and to grow? And uh, more as a done with you type of vision. So we actually, you know, if you speak to a lot of business, they really struggle to get leads, really high quality leads. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, actually, this, um, this could really be good. So I looked into it, went back about six, eight weeks later and said to him, look, I've done a lot of research. I am going to set this up. I really like it, really appreciate for your guidance on this. And would you be my first client? So they came on board with clients for a couple of years and we helped them to scale and to grow. And uh, got massive pleasure from that. And uh, they're still helping other charities and organizations stay. So that was another catalyst for change. And um, I do ultimately love putting in place uh, solutions that not only help businesses to get more clients, uh, but I love working with people, also believe in circular relationships. Um, and what I mean by that is not just a quick win win, which usually doesn't mean that at all. It normally means win-lose. What I like doing is thinking of all the stakeholders, thinking of circular relationships. So if you've got staff, if you've got investors, if you've got advocates, if you've got supporters, if you've got suppliers, think about all the people that you touch and how you can help to make them feel good to actually want to work with you and the other way around. Mm -hmm. And then what you'll find, you, you create these circular relationships where everyone wins out of it. Um, so that was a massive thing for me I wanted to see with Business Growth Bureau, but also it was the whole systemization part of it, being able to put in procedures and processes um, and to leverage technology and people all working together to do much bigger outreach to help businesses ultimately to have a continual supply of leads and opportunities coming through so that they can close more opportunities down and be much more successful and profitable businesses. Yes. Wow. And that's that's how a business growth bureau became a business, and that's how you are now. After those two years working with this one client, um, you are now working with many more clients besides that. Uh, that's right. In fact, they became the first clients, and we started taking on the clients at the same time. Oh, realised, yeah, what wasn't a, what, just a one hit wonder, as it were. Yes. Um, 
And uh, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, doing market research and all this type of stuff. And there's a lot to be said for that. We'd actually actively encourage uh, people and companies to do that. Um, having said that, there's no better form of research than you can do and then actually putting out a product or service, seeing how well it's received in the marketplace and w whether people actually buy what you have to sell. Mm. Um, we come across a lot of coaches, for example, coaches and trainers who um, who think they've actually got to have the whole course developed from start to finish before they start to offer it. Yes. And then realize that when they've put it together, that the market actually doesn't want what they've put together and they mm. need to repackage it and redesign it. And the trouble is in that time, you might be a year further down the line um, and you've lost you haven't got sales in that time. So you're financially in a much worse place. Yes. So it, it's really about trying to work with business owners to help them to become much more successful. And is that like, is that... Uh, when you talk about processes and systems, so do you have what you developed over the years then with that, starting with that one client and then working with other clients, do you have like, a, you know, a one process kind of that works for everybody? Uh, well, every process has to be bespoke uh, mm. to a degree. Yes. Um, but fundamentally, what we found is, for example, if you are trying to reach out to new clients, especially if you're using social media, um, then the first thing is you need to uh, identify your ideal type of target clients. Mm. Um, that Then you need to also position yourself as being an expert and to come across with authenticity and credibility. Um, and then once you've identified your ideal clients, you then need to uh, very much think about your ideal uh, lead generation, prospect nurturing, sales optimization process. So what if you imagine almost three cogs? So the first part is trying to find your ideal type of leads, you know, through the correct type of search. The second one is about nurturing those conversations. So that's the second cog. And the third cog is basically taking all those people who've been warmed up where they're asking to have uh, self based conversations. And uh, then engaging with those people in the right way, way so that they actually want to buy what you have to sell, then that's really the optimum way of doing it. And then wrapped around that, you really need to know your numbers. Um, you, if you know your numbers, then the good thing is you can measure your success. And also it helps you to determine how much you could afford to invest in your business uh, moving, your, moving forwards. So by plugging into that process, uh, predominantly based around what we class the, so the social selling blueprint, that's ultimately how people can get really good results through uh, increased sales. Got it. And I mean, I've, I've been on this journey as well. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I'm a small business as well. We, I need leads. Um, and the biggest challenge that I I personally have in my business, and we we did have a brief conversation about this uh, before on a previous phone call, and I believe other businesses have as well. And this might be an interesting f one for you to to explore and answer or give your view on. And that is, once you have a client, which you could have done through all of the amazing kind of lead nurturing, engaging knowing your numbers, which is great. How do you keep that client as a recurring client? Oh, no, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Uh, and I love that. And, and I'll tell you why I love it so much is what you haven't realized, Michael, is over the last three or four days, I've just spent uh, time designing a special calculator which will enable people to precisely work that out. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's great timing then. I didn't know about perfect that. perfect timing. In fact, we're about to be emailing about 65,000 people uh, or business owners uh, with access to this special calculator I've developed. Um, so, I, and it's a really good example of it. And possibly to answer that, could, if, is it okay if I take through almost two case, different scenarios, which yeah, will probably do. help people to answer yeah. that question? Yeah, please. Um, so, so scenario one is where you've got a product, service, or widget, which um, you may um, uh, perhaps sell uh, or, a, or service more on, a, say, a project basis. 
So you may have an, one sale or first sale might be a thousand pounds by value or thousand dollars by value. It might be then six months later, you have another sale, which is worth 9,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. So that means in the first 12 months, that's 10,000 pounds worth of revenue. Yeah. And then it gets to year two. And it may be that because that customer or client has got confidence in that product, service or widget, that they come back and say, okay, I'm going to spend 30,000 with you. Okay. In year two. And then they, that client just ends up being really happy. Um, so that means you've got your 10,000 plus your 30,000. That means that customers already earned your business 40,000 pounds or dollars. Yes. Yes. Okay. And it gets to year three and they go and spend another hundred thousand. So that client is worth one hundred and forty thousand pounds, say in its lifetime equivalent. Yes. OK. Um, so so the question around that. So this is scenario one is how much should you really be investing in marketing to get that client, average client that is generated perhaps one hundred and forty thousand pounds worth of revenue over mm -hmm. that time? Mm -hmm. What is that? What should you be really investing in your business to do that? So that's scenario one. Scenario two is where you've got a recurring model. So you may be an accountant. So your annual fees might be, I'm making this up, but say £10,000 or dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or it might be you're a software technology company where it's a similar value. Or it could be that uh, you are a coach and you've got a lot of retained clients and they stay with you a certain amount of time. Okay. And then in that type of scenario, what you'd find is you'd have an average retention rate per year. So, for example, it, if, if you've got a firm of accountants, they're, they're probably the easiest ones to think about, is you find with accountants, when someone becomes a client, client of a firm of accountants, they tend to stay with them for a very long time. Yes. And so it's not uncommon for the average client to stay with a firm of accountants for at least five years, possibly even 10 years. Mm. So, but there is typically a retention rate or a churn rate. So it may be that... Um, uh, every year, there's a 10% uh, uh, churn rate or a 90% retention rate, whichever way you look at it. Mm -hmm. So that that means that the lifetime value of that client uh, can be very, very high. Whereas if you've got another business, which may also work on a more of a subscription model, but their, their, their retention rate, instead of being perhaps 90%, is perhaps 30%. So what that means is every, every year... Um, that they've got to get um, that they, they, they they've got to be able to replace those customers at a much faster rate than yes. they would do if you're a firm of accountants. <gasps> so we've been able to put together a calculator which actually works all this out, and it will project this up to five years ahead. Um, so uh, and it also factors in uh, instances like you know, in terms of your um, sales splits, what are high value clients versus low value clients yes. as well. Yes. So and it's, a, it's a really important question to ask, um, because if you know that, then it really will change the way you choose to develop and grow your business. Mm. Big, and I guess I think the point you made right at the beginning of that little example is how you then spend your resources on finding those right clients that fit in that that kind of model uh, yes yeah and uh if again if you went back to that firm of accountants um for example some accountants might say what well, might actually cost them two thousand pounds or dollars to get that one customer mm. okay uh, it might be per lead it's costing the equivalent of 500 pounds but they know that for every person they sit in front of They'll convert one in four, so that means it's cost them say two thousand pounds. Yes. Um, okay. Um, but if it's cost two thousand pounds to get that one customer, but that one customer over say a ten year period has generated you a hundred thousand pounds or nine hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue, mm -hmm. isn't that a worthwhile investment? Two thousand pounds is a almost a total no brainer or pales into significance mm -hmm. if your cash flow can support it. Um, you know, so even if you made almost zero amount of money in year one in that type of scenario, the return investment is massive over the collective lifetime equivalent value of that uh, customer. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you've got a uh, product or service which has either got a much lower value, um, so therefore you need to sell a lot more of them to stand still, or the churn rate is very high, then, of course, you'll have much less uh, money to invest than you would do if you got a, a model which is based on a very high retention rate of, of clients. Mm. 
and w once you've worked out the model right which is fine so you know what it is that you need right so the the beginning point it gives you at least the model of what you need to go after so at least you've got a a vision of what you need to achieve so my question and i'm not trying to be pedantic but my question still is how do we as small businesses convince or persuade or influence or direct clients to become recurring clients um well that again is another um a good question mm. um i would say one of the first things you need to do is to look at always giving far more value than the client feels that they're actually paying for yeah and it doesn't does that doesn't mean to say something has to be cheap or low cost mm. it just means that the client has to be surprised and continually delighted through that relationship so for example one of the things that we tend to do with clients and advocate supporters we we try and do something a bit special so last year we and the year before we chartered a ship um well for the thames last year sorry the year before last and then for cow's week last year and we we invited a number of people along gave them a really amazing experience and it's by at the end of the day how people made to feel that they actually they actually remember you by mm. um and they the people then also feel a real sense of loyalty but actually it's about whatever service or product you offer about always surprising and delighting and delighting what you're doing yeah um the, the other thing is just make sure that your offer is just totally compelling um now uh, there is obviously a lot of talk on online about you know the benefits of recurring income and all that type of stuff um and, and that is entirely true mm. um but there are certain types of service which it doesn't matter however hard you try um uh, you, on the face, it would have be, uh, appear to be well suited to a recurring revenue model, but in practical terms, um, it's much more difficult. And that can be also through e-learning type solutions. So, so you know, you've got one of the biggest competitors out there is uh, it, that we all experience is also a major contributor to uh, revenue generation as well. Is something like YouTube, mm. and the reason being is especially in the e-learning space. Um, most of us will probably go to YouTube first, have a bit of a look on there and find out whether we get some answers quickly to some of our questions. Yes. And it's all there for free. So you've just got to make sure that you surprise and delight all the time. And a lot of your good, really good content, um, you should actually give away for free. Mm. But don't be frightened to do that. Because what you're mainly interested in is accelerating and building on that relational trust so that people want to work with you. And that's obviously then where you can provide a lot more in the way of high value services uh, or solutions. But the more unique you can make your proposition. So um, in our particular case, uh, you know, we offer a, uh, more of a done with yourself on lead generation, but we also offer packages which is bought based around training and support. But what we've done as well is we've also created a technology platform to help people to manage their campaigns and we also developed um, some portals as well to help them to to do that. Um, so what we've done is not only work with our clients to help them to become the best they can be in terms of market presence, but we're also there at front of mind because we're also physically providing a service and a platform for them to engage with and continual support through, you know, closed Facebook group and everything else that goes with it. So it's about trying to create the stickiness with the client and the customer so they, they actually don't want to move away from you so they, they're just attracted to you and everything you do for them yeah i i i have a name for that and that is creating a raving fan <laughs> uh yes <laughs> um i agree I, what That's i very eloquently said by the way <laughs> yeah what i what i love in what you've just said is to make your offer totally compelling and I think that's where the difference comes in. And I, I like the su being surprised and delighted, but everybody wants to do that. I think that that one sentence you just said, make your offer totally compelling. And that is hard to do, you know, <laughs> that isn't that easy to do and craft because 
um, everyone's worried about giving it away. So many people are giving it away. Um, a lot of it is also obvious in terms of what people are doing. And that's me being the cynic in terms of seeing what people do out there, you know, and 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 it doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it's done so obvious that people have got the giving the giving away this tiny little bit, and then you know there's going to be a big upsell uh, as a consequence. And sometimes, Rupert, it can sometimes it can come across very inauthentic, not with integrity. You kind of see through it, and you kind of because so many people are starting to work that way. Um, and I'm, I'm being honest in terms of what I'm seeing out there and what I'm experiencing as well. Uh, I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying that they only do half the job. They don't make it totally compelling, is what you say. Yeah, thank you ever so much for that. I, I really appreciate you reinforcing that point because mm. uh, it is really key. Um, so, and you know, your biggest com competition is free. So you've mm. got to be, uh, you know, outstanding in everything you do Yes, and come across with integrity as well. And that's, that's so important. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what, um, what's the plan now for business growth bureau? What, what direction is, are you guys going into? Uh, that's a, another great question. <laughs> Thanks for that, <laughs> Michael. It's appreciated. Um, I, I think uh, for us, we are going to be doing a lot more uh, leverage around the different technologies available. So we are starting to run uh, live streams regularly now. Uh, we're still very much in the testing phase, uh, but they will start off initially monthly, and then probably become weekly. So we'll be using uh, Facebook Live, for example. Uh, to put a lot of content out there. Mm -hmm. um, we will be starting to do a lot more in the way of podcasts as well. We've Last year, we concentrated on creating massive amounts of uh, video content, which we love to share for free. Yes. Um, and again, it's about accelerating that relation with trust and feeling that you're giving back all the time, which for me is a, a, a big motivator. Um, so, so all that's really important. And ultimately, we're looking to service other markets much more widely so we've got clients in the uk but also in the us uh, and in france as well and in holland we're actually looking to quite rapidly expand into the us and um, we're in discussions with um, another broadcaster at the moment who's potentially interested in working with us to help us in a number of different areas Great. on the other way around so it, sh it will be very exciting uh, but i would still see us as being still relatively early in that curve upwards yes. um, and, you know, we ourselves have to take our own medicine. There's every day there are things which change. Everything, things that didn't work yesterday work today. Things that did work yesterday typically don't work so well today. Mm. The, the, the whole world we live in is spinning very quickly. Everything is changing incredibly fast. And you always have to be a little bit ahead of that curve all the time if you're going to work with others and help them to become much more successful. Yeah. Absolutely. I, and, and, and that's good to hear and it's refreshing to hear because there are companies out there that are pretending that they've got it all made. And I, I always call it eating your own dog food. And <laughs> we were talking about pets earlier. You know, you, you have to practice what you teach others for yourself. Otherwise, again, it's, it's not authentic. Um, so, it's Quite. interesting that you got the word growth kind of in your company title, I guess, where you're helping people to grow at the same time, helping yourself to grow as well. Um, so, yeah, very interesting. So, Rupert, is there anything that I haven't asked or teased out of you that you wanted to, to share with the listeners? Um, yeah, I suppose actually you just touched on something that's really interesting, uh, an another point which is really interesting there. And a lot of this is around mindset uh, because, yes, we are interested in business growth, but behind that, it's all about personal growth as well. So, um, for example, it's, we come across a number of cases where 
people actually say they want to really grow their businesses. But when you sort of dig down deep, they're quite comfortable in their space they're operating in now. Yes. They perhaps moved from a job into a coaching, for example, or selling time for money, whatever shape or form that is. Um, but on the whole, they have a, people have perhaps have a fairly comfortable standard, uh, comfortable way of life. Mm. Um, and the, you've got, to me, you've always got to have that bit of hunger there if you want to be really successful. Yes. Um, and uh, so what I would say, and this stems from mindset, and we find that uh, typically there are three different types of people. The, the first type of person is someone who's, broadly speaking, replacing uh, a career for uh, self-employment. And uh, they largely do want to grow. They do want to be comfortably off yes. and be able to have a good, you know, work-life balance. Um, but actually, if they get too busy, they start to scale back their activity because they can't cope. Yes. And then you end up in this peak and trough scenario where there's not enough money coming in one month. There's too much another, being very difficult to balance things out. Yes. Then there's a second type of person who is, uh, have got a different mindset. They want to really... Uh, they see the business as bigger, being bigger themselves. And mm. uh, that sounds like it could be expensive, but if uh, it could be by partnering up with other people that helps to give you the leverage to grow. It could be that you're, you've got the mindset where you are, uh, you want, you're prepared to invest in your business and take it on to the next level. Now, that's when things can get really exciting because then if the, yourself and your team are all well aligned, um, there really isn't anything that isn't possible to do these days if you once you start to leverage people and technology yeah. and put it all together. So, yeah, so very importantly, believe in yourself, believe in what is possible and, you know, aim for aim, aim, aim for those goals and aim big ultimately if that's what you want to achieve. I love that. Yeah, that's and, you know, you're a classic example in listening to your story about your personal growth when you were doing your earlier business, because, I, you know, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today if you hadn't gone through that growth and experience yourself. And I guess there isn't a tiny element where all of us as business owners or, you know, uh, aspiring business owners, we, we have to go through that personal growth in running your own business and, um, survive some of the, you know, using the kind of uh, sailing analogy, the kind of ups and downs and the high seas um, and struggles to to survive and, and continue and, and, and also to kind of pivot and reinvent ourselves because I've had to do that several times as well. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'd love to hear your journey a little bit more after the call. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, Rupert. Well, um, share with the listeners, where can they find more about uh, Business Growth Bureau? What kind of website, social media links, etc.? Yeah, no, thank you for asking. Um, well, on LinkedIn, I'm fairly easy to find because the spelling of my name is very unusual. So it's Rupert, R-U-P-E-R-T, and it's Honeywood without the E, so, you, so it's H-O-N-Y-W-O-O-D. Um, so probably just search for that name. It'll probably come up straight away anyway. Um, if you want to reach our website and also access lots of free content, if you go to businessgrowthbureau.com, um, you'll find um, under, I think it's under the TV video section, you'll be able to find a lot of um, uh, material which we've made available to people and also some downloadable books as well. And uh, finally, if you had wanted to um, you know, benefit from some free um, coaching in terms of lead generation, getting more sales, uh, you're very welcome to uh, jump on board a training webinar, which is the same URL, businessgrowthbureau.com, and put just put forward slash um, register on the end, and that will take you straight to the page in question. Um, but yes, absolutely delighted to help, and people are also very welcome to e email me at the same address. So it's rupert at businessgrowthbureau.com. Um, so ever so grateful for asking me on the show, Michael. Thank you, and thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, in, in so much detail and love what you're doing and I hope it continues to grow for you as well uh, in helping other people grow. And hopefully we, we haven't met in person yet, but hopefully uh, we will meet in person soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate it. Okay, take care, Rupert. All the best. Bye for yeah, now. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 